As we continue to worship this morning, I'm going to encourage you to take your copy of God's Word. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew this morning. The Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Our middle school choir, our sanctuary choir, and our instrumentalists have led us so beautifully this morning to worship Him. To worship Him in all of His splendor and His majesty. Holy is He. Ernest Hemingway, decades ago, wrote a short story entitled the capital of the world. And the opening paragraph of that story has stuck with me. And it goes like this. Hemingway writes, Madrid is full of boys named Paco, which is short for Francisco. There's a joke from Madrid about a father who came to Madrid and inserted an advertisement in the personal columns of the local newspaper, which read, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana Noon, Tuesday, all is forgiven, Papa. Again, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana. Noon, Tuesday, all is forgiven, Papa. Hemingway writes that the next day, 800 young men named Paco showed up at the Hotel Montana. Now, that story is intended to ring a bell of familiarity to people that would know the prevalence of the name Paco, especially in Spain. But there's a far deeper layer of meaning. It's a meaning of how many are seeking, how many are longing, how many would, would love just to hear one sentence, three words, all is forgiven. How many Pacos are in our midst? How many sons or daughters longing to hear the words of a mother or a father, all is forgiven? How many co-workers, neighbors, how many brothers and sisters? There are a lot of Pacos in our world 800 in Hemingway's story showed up at noon, but hundreds, thousands, millions live among us, longing for that restoration, longing for forgiveness. If you're new to Dawson, we have embarked upon a new series entitled Simply Forgiveness. We're opening up God's word, asking what are the foundations for us to pursue forgiveness in our earthly relationships. Last week, first week of the series, we set what I believe God's word teaches us to be the only steady, the only secure, the only sturdy foundation of forgiveness. And that is the truth that God is the forgiver. God is the ultimate forgiver. And so today I want us, and in the coming weeks, to answer some practical questions from the Word of God. And the first question I want us to embark upon, searching the Word to answer the question, who are we called to forgive? It's a who question. Now, to ask that question, there's got to be some semblance of understanding of, of what does it actually mean to forgive? So what is forgiveness also? So as we answer the who question, we've got to also answer the what question. And next week, we're going to embark upon the how question. How do we pursue forgiveness practically in our life? Now, anytime we talk about forgiveness, if we're going to be honest here, our, our instinctual first step is to set a fence I mean, some, some real deep fence post to say, yeah, yeah, I'm all about forgiveness as long as friends and family members, co-workers, acquaintances, even strangers are inside of this fence. And if they're inside of the fence, I'm going to pursue forgiveness. But there got to be limits, right? they got to be boundaries, right? Pushovers, no, we don't need to be. Enablers, no, we don't need to be. So anytime we start pursuing a conversation of who to forgive, there is the temptation to, to draw out some limitations. Who's in and who's out? If that's your instinct, and I think at a deep place, it's all of our instinct. Hey, we're not alone. It was the instinct of one of the disciples of Jesus 
named Peter. P- Peter wanted to ask a who question. What are the limits of forgiveness? Hear the word of the Lord in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Another way to translate this is, how often will my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? Jesus replies, or Peter asks, as many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a 100 denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Verse 35, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. A difficult word from our Lord. It is birthed out a very straightforward question that Peter has, and it is a question that has a background to it. Peter's asking the question, Lord, if someone crosses me seven times, do do I have an exemption from forgiveness once we get to the eighth and the ninth and the tenth time? Now, it's easy for us to think that Peter is just drawing a random number out of his head to be able to see what the limitations of forgiveness are. But you would, you would misunderstand and mishear this parable and Peter's question if you don't understand that floating in the background of Peter's question is a rabbinical teaching that is contemporaneous to this actual parable. So you have Jewish rabbis, not those that, that we see in the Old Testament or that give us the word of God, but drawing upon the Old Testament and teaching teaching the people of God in Jesus' time how to actually practically live out things. So it's floating around that three strikes and you're out. Now they wouldn't say it that way, but they would say that you would forgive a person until they get to the fourth time or the fifth time or the sixth time. So Peter, what does Peter do? He takes not three strikes and you're out, but actually he doubles it, more than doubles it. He says, hey, Jesus, I know you know the teaching that if we get to the fourth and the fifth time, we don't have to pursue forgiveness here. So I'm wondering, is seven enough? Now, seven is not a random number here. You know this walking through God's word that seven is a number of what? Completion, perfection, fullness. So Peter is thinking maybe seven is that number that then if a person has wronged a person to the eighth time and the ninth time, the tenth time, they're outside of the fence of forgiveness. They don't have to pursue forgiveness. And what does Jesus do? He responds with another number in the English Standard Version, which is our Pew Bible and the Bible that I've just read from and what you see here. Jesus responds with 77 times. Now, lest you think Jesus is just drawing a bigger fence with a fence post further away, and then once a person gets on their tally of wrongs and sins and injustices, once that person gets to 78, they are able to say, oh, yep, you're outside of the fence, the fence of forgiveness. What Jesus is doing is he's saying, you say seven, and I'm just going to say 77, a number of absolute completion, perfection, fullness. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's not talking about the number. 
He is saying you are called to radical forgiveness, almost a, a sort of toy story to infinity and beyond. We are called to extend forgiveness. Jesus is a master storyteller. He could see probably the gaze look in Peter's eye thinking to himself, really, Jesus, really? 77 times? Jesus says there's a, there's a king and that king is owed this debt by one of his servants and the debt is 10,000 talents. Now, we're reading through the currency here and it is very difficult for us to, to feel the weight of 10,000 talents. We need a little bit of conversion, uh, a currency conversion right here. We need to talk about what 10,000 talents actually represented. Talents, the highest currency in the Greco-Roman world. So to get one talent, one talent, you have to have 6,000 denarii. And if you have 6,000 denarii, that to, to get one denarius, that is a day's wage. So let's do the calculations here. If a servant works 300 days a year, that servant is going to have to work 20 years to get to one talent. I remind you, how many talents does this servant owe? 10,000. So doing the math here, this servant has got to work 200,000 years to be able to pay back his wages. Church, this is absolutely monopoly money here. This is Mark Cuban monopoly money conversation here. So Jesus is, is, is saying in, in our language, here's a servant, he owes billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. And of course the servant can't pay it. Here's the consequence. He and his family are gonna be sold into slavery here. The servant begs for his mercy. The king in this moment of great empathy shows him forgiveness doesn't throw him nor his family into prison, but he owns the debt, this incalculable debt of 10,000 talents. So that same forgiven servant, we don't know if it's just the next day or around, this next servant, this same servant is walking around and guess what? He sees someone that owes him money. Is it 10,000 servants or 10,000 talents that, that he is owed? No, it is in this parable, 100 denarii. That is not insignificant, but nothing compared to what he owed the king. That's about three months wages here. So we have the same conversation. This servant in verse 28, he goes and he chokes the person that owes him the money. He begins to rough him up. We hear the replaying of the very same words that the servant said to the king. This person that owes the forgiven servant says those same words here. Have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And instead of those words sort of ringing with this resonance, oh yeah, I just was forgiven this incalculable debt. He's harsh, bitter, and ultimately the one who is forgiven doesn't forgive. Throws him into prison. It just so happened to be that there were some fellow servants that had overheard the king forgiving this man his debt. And now the forgiven servant is, is throwing this other person in prison. And in essence, they tell on him to the master. Hey, we heard, we saw, you need to know. And so the king calls him back in. Verse 32, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. Jesus' parables oftentimes end with sort of this open-ended nature to it. The church for 2,000 years wonders exactly what's the punchline of the parable here. In this parable, none of this is left to our imagination. Verse 35, Jesus says, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. It's a difficult word from our Lord. But here's the truth. The truth that resounds in this parable is that a forgiven people are called to be a forgiving people. We can't run from this. If you are a follower of Jesus, a forgiven people are called to be a forgiving people. The forgiven forgive. Jesus tells this story 
to sink into the soul of Peter. We, through the power of the Holy Spirit, overhear this story, and it sinks into our soul. We, we want to erect our fences. Is it seven? Is it 10? Is it 20? When do we get to the limits? We don't want to be pushovers. We don't want to be enablers, all of this. And then we miss the point of the parable, which is that God forgives incalculable debts. Debts that we owe, that, that we could not pay off if we had 2,000 years of eternity ahead of us to pay for it. We, we, we could not pay off this debt. And so God, as the king, God, as the master, he looks upon us and the debt is paid. It is paid not through your good intentions, not through your remorse, not through you saying to the king, I really wish I had done something different. No, that debt is paid by the blood of his son by the sacrifice of Jesus. So God the Father, he doesn't ignore our sin. He doesn't ignore injustice. He doesn't ignore wrong. It has just been paid in full by someone else who actually has the currency of perfection to pay for our imperfections. There's actually someone who can cover our incalculable sin debt. And if you by faith have received his forgiveness, you, my friend, have received more than this servant in this parable could ever dream of receiving. This is good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we have been forgiven, we as disciples then are called to pursue forgiveness as Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we pursue forgiveness as God in Christ forgave us. But here's the problem. What does this look like? Oftentimes when we start talking about forgiveness, we, 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 live, we leave it in the stratosphere of just sort of the hypothetical. We, we leave it way high up. We talk about forgiveness as if everybody understood exactly what we're called to do and exactly what this looks like. But we need to wonder to ourselves, what practically does this mean for my life and, my, and your life here? How do we actually pursue forgiveness? And to do that, sometimes we've got to clear out what forgiveness isn't. We've got to do some dirt work to be able to erect a definition from the word of God of forgiveness that, it, it, that, that takes some of, the, some of the, the wrong things out. So let me just give you a couple of those. What forgiveness is not. Forgiveness, my friends, is not approving of one's sin. Forgiveness, church, is not accepting, is okay, ignoring, or justifying someone's sin. It is not approval of, nor is an acceptance of. And the wonderful parable, or not parable, the wonderful story that really illustrates this for all of us here is, is found in John chapter 8, where there's a woman that is called an adultery, and she's brought before the religious leaders, and Jesus happens to be there, and they pick up their stones, and they're going to, they're going to stone this woman for her sin. And it's in this moment that Jesus says these words that still hang on with all of us. Hey, all of you religious leaders, go ahead and throw the first stone if, if you don't have sin. And so this woman is bracing for the stones to come to her and the sound of what it's going to be like for these stones to pelt her flesh. But instead she hears the stones dropping to the ground one by one from the oldest to the youngest. And it's in this moment, I, I cannot wait. I don't know if we got footage of this. I don't know if we'll get to heaven and be able to see exactly this moment, but it's got to be one of the most tender moments in all of scripture. Where this woman who's been battered, this woman who's been beaten, this woman in this moment who has been exposed and humiliated before all to see, looks up and in the midst of her tears that are streaming down her face, sees the compassion of her Savior. Where are all of your accusers? Where are all who condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This woman caught in adultery receives forgiveness from Jesus, but not approval of sin, not of acceptance of sin, not a, it's no big deal from Jesus. Forgiveness, church, is not 
approval. It's not acceptance, but more than that, forgiveness doesn't always, and it's not excusing. Sometimes uh, and oftentimes in our life, there is some type of justification, some type of alibi that someone is going to offer that then brought them to that place where they've wronged, brought them to that place of sin, brought them to that place to injustice. And sometimes we feel in our mind that to forgive a person must then mean to believe and to accept the excuse as is if it is the causation of what occurred. And that is not what forgiveness is. We can see around us, there are times where we're to excuse behavior, no doubt. I mean, if you're in Walmart or Publix and you see a two-year-old in a cart and that two-year-old's throwing a tantrum, you're able to see, yeah, I, I kind of get this. Now, if you see a 23-year-old in the same grocery cart throwing a fit, we got another kind of story here, do we not? But you can see at times, yeah, terrible twos, I understand, that makes sense to me. When you have an appointment and you're going with one of your friends and you wait and you wait and five minutes turns into 10 minutes and 10 minutes turns into 15 minutes and finally you call that person and they say oh I thought we were supposed to meet on the 8th and today's the 18th and I wrote it down wrong well what we understand that but there are other times where someone offers an excuse and that excuse is not valid and I want you to hear that ultimately forgiveness does not mean that you have to one accept or even believe an excuse Forgiveness is not excusing. Forgiveness is not approving. Forgiveness is also not forgetting. One of these days, I'm going to preach a whole sermon series entitled, The Bible Doesn't Actually Say That. Okay? And I've got, I don't know all the messages that I'm going to, to preach on, but certainly I'm going to have one on, hey, follow your heart. I'm sure I'm going to have a message on God will never give you more than you can handle. You know, these things aren't actually in the Bible. And another one is certainly going to be in this series of messages that is going to be entitled Forgive and Forget. And I get, I, I get sort of the gist of what's going on there. I understand the motivation behind that. Don't be paralyzed by a wrong or a sin or injustice. Take steps forward, move through, move forward. I get how someone could look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. God will remember our sins no more and feel as if God has some sort of divine amnesia. Of course he doesn't. He knows full well what we've done. And a part of the forgiveness of our sins from God is every last one of our sins were paid for fully upon the cross. God doesn't forget these things. They're just paid for. And he throws them into this endless sea of his grace where our sin doesn't get the last word. And if we think that the only way that we can forgive someone is to fully forget what occurred, we're living in a place of impossibility for the vast majority of us. We'll never take steps forward in forgiveness here. The, the beautiful offer of the gospel is something deeper than forgive and forget. The beautiful truth of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit in you is that through the Spirit of God working through us and in us, we actually can move to a place where we can begin to forgive those things that we will never truly forget. We won't forget them on earth. And I'm not sure we're going to forget them in eternity. But we are able through the power of the Spirit of God to move forward to where those scars do not get the first nor the last nor every word of our life. I was in the eighth grade. I was playing basketball, middle school team. I drive in, going up for a layup, and the defender's elbow catches me in the forehead, and that elbow won the match. Fall back on the ground. Blood is going everywhere. They cart me off, take me to the ER, and they stitch me up. Next morning, I'm getting ready to go to school. Eighth grade again, very conscientious of all that an eighth grader would be conscientious of. And the only thing that I can see as I look into the mirror is what? The stitches that are just glaring. That's all I could see. The next week, approximately I get the stitches out. I'm looking in the mirror as I get ready. All I can see is this wound, this scar. I don't know how it was, but, but months later, probably, I, I could get ready and I would still see it, but it was beginning to heal. And then months and years later, even now, as a grown adult, when I'm getting ready, I can still see the remnant of that wound that is there, but it is healed. And when I look deeply, I can see, but I can assure you, every morning when I wake up and I look into the mirror, that wound doesn't get the last word, nor does it get the first word, nor does it get any word. 
It's there, but I've been able through that healing process to move forward. And all of us in this room will to some degree have scars. I mean, even our Savior in eternity in his resurrection body still has the scars of the cross. And it is a reminder to us that that our wounds are not the only word of who we are. And the scars, they're not the essence of everything that has happened to us and who we are. God desires for us to, to be able to heal. It is a hard process at times. It is a difficult process. It's a painful process. It's a messy process, of course. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wants us to not forget those things forever and ever, but ultimately be able to pursue forgiveness in those places that we can never truly forget. So forgiving isn't approving, excusing, forgetting. Or forgiveness is not also reconciling. One of the real hangups in people pursuing forgiveness is when they think forgiveness and reconciliation are synonyms. That forgiveness always means the restoration of a relationship and the restoration of, of a proximity to a person, trust given to a person. And there are a variety of reasons, and, and, and this could be a longer list here, But there are a variety of reasons why you can pursue forgiveness and there not actually be reconciliation because there are times where you're pursuing forgiveness and that other person on the receiving end or the other person that was on the uh, the end of the injustice or whatever it was, they won't even talk to you. They don't even acknowledge that there was a wrong and you can pursue forgiveness without reconciliation. There are times that the offender, the only way that we are able to quote unquote be with them is to go to the grave. Because for decades, they have not been walking in our midst. And God calls us to forgiveness, even of those people who are not walking with us. And finally, there are times, and this is why forgiveness is very personal, and this is why forgiveness is always done in a Christian community. It's always done with with loving friends, wise pastoral and ministerial guidance. It's, It's always done, I think, best with good, loving, biblical Christian counselors and Christian psychologists. This is a process. We we need to also be reminded that there are times where the restoration of trust and the restoration of proximity could be emotionally harmful and it also could be physically harmful for you and maybe even others that are close to you. But you can still pursue forgiveness even when there's not going to be the restoration of the proximity to that person or even the trust of that person. I say this passage more than I think any other passage when I'm counseling people and talking with people is Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. I mean, this is Paul saying, peace, harmony, forgiveness, it's not easy. And there are going to be some obstacles to it. But as far as it depends upon you, if possible, pursue this. So forgiveness doesn't always mean reconciliation. It's not forgetting, it's not excusing, it's not approving. Then the question is, what is it? Well, we've received forgiveness and the forgiveness of our father begins to be a model for how we talk about forgiveness. We receive forgiveness freely, but that forgiveness comes with a hefty eternal price tag. Our forgiveness was bought with the blood of our savior here. So our forgiveness was costly. So human forgiveness, church, it is costly. Let me say it this way. This is my definition here. It's not perfect. It's not from God's word. It's based upon God's word. But there's not a Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 that says this sentence here. We're going to unpack it over the next two weeks here. Forgiveness is a costly commitment. It's a costly commitment that begins in a moment in time and is also a process over time. 
Every one of those words are really important. As we talk about forgiveness, it's a costly commitment that begins at a moment in time and it is also a process over time. What does it cost you to forgive? Let me tell you what it costs you to forgive. It costs you letting go of the wrong. You know what it costs you to forgive? It costs you of letting go of the desire for revenge. It costs you releasing the situation to the Lord. It costs you truly believing and trusting that vengeance is ultimately the Lord's and no wrong that is ever done to me or to you, no wrong that occurs on our earth is, is ignored, nor is it forgotten. But forgiveness is, is the opposite of our natural instinct. Do you know what our instinct is? Is to hold on to wrongs, to nurse our wounds, to forever confine a person and define a person by what they have done to us on purpose or maybe even accidentally. Forgiveness lets go of the wrong and it allows us to move forward. And what can be difficult, it allows the other person to move forward. Instead of always plotting or always hoping the worst for that person. So who do I forgive, church? Who are you as a follower of Christ called to forgive? You you know what the word of God teaches us? That we are called to forgive those people who have wronged us. We are called to forgive those people that we might not like. We're called to forgive those people that we don't feel deserve it. And you know, we are called to forgive those people that we don't feel like forgiving. Forgiveness is not a feeling, my friends. It is a costly commitment. It is a decision in time and it is a commitment over time. So who are these people? Who are these people that we're called to forgive? Someone in this sanctuary might need to hear the labels of the types of people that we're called to forgive. Do you know who the people that we're called to forgive as followers of Jesus? They're they're fathers and mothers. That's who we're called to forgive. You know who we're called to forgive? Sons and daughters. Do you know who we're called to forgive? Son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. Do you know who we're called to forgive? Father-in-laws and mother-in-laws. You know who we're called to forgive? Neighbors. You know who we're called to forgive? Co-workers. You know who you're called to forgive? Church members who maybe sit in a Sunday school class with you or sit on a pew with you. You know who we're called to forgive? Spouses. Do you know who we're called to forgive? Exes. Do you know who we're called to forgive? Strangers whose years ago we, we never knew their name and now for all the years that we have, we'll never forget their name. We're called to forgive those kinds of people. Do you know who we're called to forgive? We're called to forgive those people who have passed on. Do you know who we're called to forgive? We're called to forgive those people who are walking in our midst. Do you know who we're called to forgive? Yourself. Yourself. You know who we're called to forgive? Everyone. How do we do this? Is this hard? You better believe it. Do we really want to do this? Most often not. But we were reminded, is there anything too hard for our Lord? Who? Same time, same place right here, we'll open up God's word and ask how. Let us pray.